This is um, a, an all-day program that's going to focus on um, emerging um, technology. It's, uh, it's, I'm going to give a, a brief PowerPoint, um, which is going to kind of lay out what we're going to do today and also talk about some of the issues and frame the issues and, and also the model regulations. Um, we're we're going to be handing out at this point um, the model regulations. Does everybody have a copy, a hard copy of them yet? Okay, Brooke, um, Karen, can we hand out the uh, model regs? You all should have received this um, via email, um, but we're going to be focusing on these for at least one half of the day. The, the box is outside. Um, all right, so I think you know who I am at this point. Um, but for those of you who don't, uh, I was the taxi commissioner in New York for way too many years. Um, all right, so uh, we're here today. Um, I've stayed on board as president of ITR. It's a lot of fun. Um, but I'm also, uh, for those of you who don't know what else I'm doing, involved in a lot of research. Uh, I work at the City University of New York as a distinguished lecturer with the uh, City College. Uh, we have 10 uh, UTRC programs. The UTRC, um, and, uh, is Camille here? Camille, are you here today? There we go. Camille's the director of the University Transportation Research Center, Region 2. Um, he's our director, um, and that's one of, I believe, 10 regional um, regional centers that the United States Department of Transportation selects. Uh, in order to conduct research in the area. Uh, very critical, uh, er any type of federal, state, or local funding for any type of research relating to transportation goes through these facilities. I'm proud to be uh, the first taxi expert to join anywhere, um, and working with the taxi network in ITR, we, on day three, are going to be talking about um, a major research agenda that we have, which is going to try to create a body of research with no which, where none exist. Um, one of the major, we got it working? One of the major priorities of our research is technology. That's one of the priorities that's on our list. Um, you could argue that our Rogue App report was one report that advanced technology, but we're working on black box technology studies and a lot of stuff in that area. In addition, I think you all know I, I do practice law. I'm a recovering lawyer. Okay, got it. Um, <laughs> still recovering. Um, and um, I'm a partner and chairman at uh, Windows Marks, the transportation law practice there. All right. Now, um, I've been around the world uh, talking about apps, um, listening and learning and breathing apps. Uh, this is just some of the cities that I've been to. Everybody's got a different perspective on it. Um, as we start going around the world and, and getting different perspectives, I think that the one common denominator is that apps uh, could be a good thing, technology is a good thing, but how you get from A to B is a lot more complicated. Um, I don't know if there are any Beatles fans in the audience, but uh, it's, quite, it's been a bit of a magical mystery tour. Um, I don't know who the walrus is um, or what it stands for. Uh, any Seinfeld fans in the audience? Anybody ever watch Seinfeld? There's this Canadians, do you watch yeah. that stuff? Okay, you can just call me the app man. I, this is all that I do all day is talk about apps. People call me about apps. That's uh, pretty much w all we do. And there are apps for everything. In fact, um, Karen and I were talking about the possibility of ITR having an app. Um, I don't know, we're gonna talk to the board about that. Um, it has nothing to do with transportation. There's an app, I was just at a, a, a convention, um, a Limo Digest show, where they have an app basically for the show, where everything that happens in the show, you're getting uh, blasts on things and you can put it on your app. Um, I mean, you, somebody was telling me they went to get a haircut and their barber has an app. I mean, apps are everywhere. Uh, some are real, some are, um, have good technology, some are being made in, in people's basements, and people don't, some people don't know what they're doing. Um, and some are good apps with bad marketing, and some are um, unreal, junky apps that have great marketing. Um, so, <laughs> the question is, is it the Wild West? Um, and I think it kind of is right now. Um, this is a, a new frontier, um, you know, internationally, not just in the U.S. Um, and here's just, <laughs> here's just a sampling of some. This is not all of them. There's like a new app coming out every day. Um, some of you may see your apps on here. Um, 
but it's important to recognize all apps are <laughs> not created equal. <laughs> um, look, they work a lot of different ways. I think many of you know this by now. The, the general essence of this is that the passenger has a phone. You run the app. You know, they're pretty much all free. I haven't seen one you had to pay for in trans for transportation services. You book the vehicle. In theory, the vehicle shows up on time. Um, you can actually, like you're in the back of an airplane, you know, watching it come to you. Um, this is something that started, for the most part, in San Francisco with some experiments, and it's uh, obviously over the last year, it's gotten, gotten around to every place that you can imagine. You book the vehicle. Some of them have payment processing, which is automatic. Um, there are some apps that you can actually give to the driver as well. So the driver has a phone where they have an app and they can correspond directly um, you know, to whoever's be doing the dispatching. Um, we started because the regulators basically started calling my office and Karen. The phone was ringing off the hook when a lot of these media stories started to appear. So um, my firm, on a pro bono basis, basically prepared a report to frame the issues. We did a lot of research. We looked at several cities. And we looked at a lot of apps, and, and we did a factual review to see how they're functioning. And um, you know, we, did, we coined the term, which is now in common usage. It could probably be in, in Webster's Dictionary at this point. Um, rogue apps. Everybody is talking about rogue apps. I had no idea that when we said we're going to do a, a report on rogue apps, it was going to become basically a, a you know, new terminology in the uh, a a term of art. Um, and it's called rogue smartphone apps for cabs and limos, innovation or unfair competition? That is the question. Um, we did this review. We framed some of the issues. Um, so I've, as I've given some of these PowerPoints around the world, um, people have asked me, are they rogue or not? Um, I don't know. I, I, so we tried to put together a definition of rogue. Um, it's one which allows for a passenger to hail or accept the dispatched cab or limousine via handheld smartphones that operate with location technology and or payment processing programs inconsistent with or in violation of four higher ground transportation regulations. I thought it would be helpful to put a, 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 an Oxford uh, English dictionary definition of what rogue is. Rogue is defined as behaving in ways that are not expected or not normal, often in a destructive way, without control or discipline, behaving abnormally or dangerously, erratic, unpredictable. I think that probably sums it up. Um, I'm trying to think of famous people and things that have been defined as rogue. I, there was a, a, a motorcycle gang in my neighborhood no, known as the Rogue Animals. I was telling Mike about that the other night. Uh, one famous rogue person is, uh, <coughs> I don't know if you remember her, how soon we forget, Sarah Palin going rogue. Um, <laughs> let's get to the legal issues. Um, what, what, is, um, what is the use of a smartphone app? Is it a prearrangement? or an e-hail, an, an actual street hail? I don't know. Um, it's, an, it's an open question. We need to address this. When rules were passed 10, 20 years ago, no one ever anticipated these things to happen. Um, and, and also, the, the big question is, um, how do apps and the e-hail concept fit into the, the various definitions that we have set locally, which are, are, are varying and diverse? in all the local jurisdictions around the world. There's usually a limousine category and a taxi cab category. Uh, the issue is, is that some jurisdictions don't define them that well. There's a lot of gray area. And you know, it's exploited by, by rogue apps, potentially. Um, there's also, everybody's very proprietary about the use of the word taxi or cab. Consumer confusion could result from apps that are using the word taxi when a limo is actually showing up. I mean, there's a certain legal and service mode distinction or expectation um, that, that comes with that, and that we have to take a look at. Um, also, there's the obvious safety concerns. Um, you know, if somebody is showing up in a vehicle and you have no idea what the name, license number of the driver is, or if there's a, if it's a third party app that's sending somebody that you as a consumer have absolutely no idea uh, whether that car is licensed or not. And some of them are not. It is a fact. In DC here as well, I think uh, Ron even uh, did a sting operation early on in this process. 
Um, the bottom line is, is that there are potentially unlicensed drivers, uninsured drivers. It's a danger to the public, so there's a safety concern. Service refusals. Um, you know, apps can allow a driver to accept a decline potential dispatches. Now, this is a potential no-no. I mean, you could actually look on some apps at the tipping history and decide, you know what, this person didn't tip me too well. I'm not going to take them this time. They'd be surprised how they remember who you are. Um, and in addition to the possible violation of driver's rules, po the discrimination against consumers can occur because they don't want to take a certain individual based upon who they look or where they're going to. This is the essence of why we regulate. Um, fair fares. Uh, some apps operate by charging passengers at the end of the trip, um, and the consumer has no assurance as to the final fare or whether the charge is fair. Um, the other question is um, whether it's a taxi meter or not. And this is the, this is the um, $10,000 question um, and the most significant problem that we face. I don't care what anybody tells you. This, now that I got it back, I can, this is why I needed to get it back. This is a taxi meter for some apps. Um, we have John Barton and Don here from, from um, our weights and measures experts who are going to talk later today. The working group that ITR and TLPA and a lot of the industry has been involved in has reached a conclusion that these apps that operate and charge fares based upon time and distance are taxi meters. And they're unauthorized at this time. Okay? And they, there are a couple of issues that we learned when we heard from the experts at this meeting. Number one, how many of you have navigation devices for your cars? Okay. I mean, has anybody not gotten lost? Or been off a block or two? Okay, being off a couple of blocks is, could lead to ten, twenty dollars, a couple of dollars being overcharged. Has anybody ever seen a GPS blocker before? Canada? You actually, it's illegal in the US, but you could buy it on internet sites from Canada. Um, and it's 50 bucks. And as a passenger, you can sit in the back of the car and start hitting it and disrupt the signal. So if you have an iPhone app that's operating with time and distance, you could actually shortchange the driver and rip off the driver. Can and does happen. It's not an exact science, but and this is why it's important. There's a Wall Street Journal article out today where I felt it was important on behalf of ITO to, to defend the regulators. These regulators in this group are pro-technology. Anyone to say otherwise or to name call is ridiculous and childish, all right? If you remember, last, last year in Toronto, uh, I think some of the people in the group were actually upset that Mark Cohen and Christiane and some of the, the progressive regulators on the panel were talking about how we want to have apps. We want to do something that's new and innovative. Well, now the tables have turned because of a lot of name calling and a lot of inappropriate behavior. Um, but the commitment of this group and to every regulator to new technology is, is clear, unequivocal, and it's a matter of doing it the right way, safe, to protect passengers, um, and to do it in a way which is in accordance with law. We're a nation of laws, all right? There's a process for this, and um, Don and John are going to talk about it today. It's, you know, it can be streamlined. Um, it can take a little time, but the software in these programs needs to be approved. The software and meters are approved. Publication 14 has a checklist. Um, they, they actually, th there's nothing more exact than having a meter that's tied into the car. It's, it's, pr it's pretty darn accurate. Uh, but even in those situations, there, there, there are problems that occur. It has to be tamper-proof. It has to be tied up. The process and the way it works, basically, is that um, NIST will usually start um, you know, its, its review of new meter, new types of meters, and including something like this. It'll then go to, to regional weights and measures conferences, and ultimately, for most jurisdictions, end up with approval at the national conference every year, where Handbook 44, which is the Bible of weights and measures, is updated, and then, of course, Publication 14, which is the uh, certification checklist for weights and measures officials. It's, um, it's a quasi-form of federal re regulation, but really it, it's state and local regulation. And not everybody complies with, with uh, these methods, but most jurisdictions uh, rely on Handbook 44. This is, real, this is probably the most important thing for regulators in a lot of ways, um, to make sure that people aren't ripped off. Um, okay, we've heard a lot a bit about surge pricing. 
Um, it's pretty much uh, pretty clear to, I think, all of the regulators that surge pricing is overcharging. It's illegal. It's ripping people off. Uh, we don't necessarily, we're, we're not, um, as regulators, in a position where on New Year's Eve, you should be um, you know, paying five or ten times the amount. In, in New York City years ago, we'd, we'd, we'd impound vehicles for that. Um, probably the worst example, and uh, an inappropriate use of the word surge, is people are dying, okay, and are homeless in New York City. You know, we had one app that was out there that was actually um, charging people hundreds of dollars to go someplace. I understand people have their viewpoints on what economics should be. Some of these viewpoints may be somewhat libertarian, okay? Regulators are here to make sure that fares are consistent, that they're fair, um, and people may differ over this philosophically, but it's tried and true. All of the regulations in every city prohibit something like this. Um, we believe it prohibits it already. Um, there's a lot going on. Okay, regulators do an air part today, but private industry has commenced lawsuits, and some government entities have started some lawsuits. There's, uh, you know, there's a dispute going on between uh, <laughs> Cambridge, Massachusetts is fighting with uh, the state of Massachusetts on whether, whether um, this is something that needs to be approved as a meter. Um, I think that Cambridge is correct. Um, Chicago, there's a class action lawsuit, actually a class action lawsuit, and also a direct lawsuit against um, one of the app companies there. One just happened in San Francisco as well. Several companies, including, including some group ride companies, were fined the other day by the California Public Utilities Commission involving the use of limousine apps. And I think you're gonna see more of that in the coming weeks, and I think regulators and the industry needs to keep an eye on how the, uh, the lawsuits are progressing. A lot of them allege a variety of causes of action, including the Lanham Act and deceptive trade practices. Um, the essence of these causes of action are basically that um, there are laws in every state, consumer protection laws, where individuals and are uh, licensed, properly licensed law-abiding uh, companies who are being unfairly competed with by those who don't have licenses and who are stealing their pa passengers and their drivers um, can bring a, a, a potential cause of action. Um, I think some of these lawsuits are very strong. Um, there's going to be more of them, okay, um, uh, potentially in some other major cities in the next week, week, weeks that unfold. Um, and I, I think what, what the danger is to the industry, and, you know, Al and, and Bill and the TLPA have, have really um, spent a lot of time with getting their act together at the industry level, not just on the PR front, but talking to their members in the industry about how you need to do something. You know, a lot of people are talking about technology, but now the goods, I guess the, the silver lining in this whole thing um, is really that some of these role gaps have moved people who were otherwise sitting a, a little bit stagnant and got them moving. There are companies developing their own apps. There are white label apps that we'll talk about. Um, as you can see from the panel, we have all these business people that have their own apps and, and, and feel that they, 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 in the competitive marketplace, on a level playing field can compete and, and do the best service. So that's a good thing, that, that the one good thing that's come out of this so far is it's got people moving. But, you know, the role gap, make no mistake about it, the role gap is a setup to basically, if you do business with them as an industry, okay, if you start ha hanging out with a role gap that has no liability for anything and just wants to help you in the summer months when things are slow, Okay, in New York City, for example, some black car bases have started to do business with a rogue app, and they're lose, they're after the, 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 the sixty or seventy thousand dollars a month comes in in extra revenue, and the base owners are very happy about that. Days later, their drivers are leaving to go hang out with the rogue apps and to go rogue on the streets. At the same time, okay, it may be easy for the black car industry, okay, let's say in New York City for them to, um, to welcome this because who cares? You know, they're taking livery industry uh, or taxi industry fares and we're getting them. The reality is is that um, a row gap in New York City is taking the passengers away from livery and taxi businesses and stealing the drivers from the black car business. It's a, it's a real nice bait and switch. And I can guarantee you that that's the business plan of row gaps in other cities. Now, of course, as the industry usually does, well, what the hell is my regulator doing about it? It's their fault, right? Right? It's, well, it's not. It's not the regulator's fault. So, um, you know, we basically got together 
at the ITR after the phone call started again. What are we going to do about this? We need to show some leadership, right? So I made a round of phone calls and eagerly all the major cities um, that are very active and involved in the ITR and some new ones uh, jumped on board and we formed an app committee just like the TLPA did. And the purpose of the committee is to develop model regs to ensure that smartphone app technology can exist fairly, safely, and with accountability to protect the consumer while creating a level playing field for transportation providers. Uh, they've asked me to chair the committee. These are some of the cities that are on it. And also, we have the weights and measures professionals that have joined the committee as well. Um, so here we are. Does everybody have the model regs now? OK. So we spent a lot of time on this. My firm worked uh, pro bono on this as well um, to help with the lawyers that we have that are trained in this stuff. And um, after we, we, this has been vetted by the committee, okay, which includes all the people that you saw. Um, it's, it's close to unanimity. I mean, it's not, you're never gonna get a complete consensus on every issue, but it was pretty complete. Also, we worked very closely with the app committee and Al from the TLPA who provided comments on this. And we want your comments today. I'm gonna just briefly describe them. Um, and you know, there'll be an opportunity over the next month to provide more comments. And all the panelists today, after they describe their technology and after they describe what, what they can do with their technology, we'd also love to hear your thoughts on these apps and if there, um, there are things in the model rules you would like to have changed, um, then we're going to have a public hearing in the afternoon and we'll talk about that. But let's go through just what the model regs say. The first thing is we tried as best we could, if looking at a lot of jurisdictions, to come up with a model definition. Um, for um, the various modes of transportation. So we thought it made sense, uh, unlike New York City, which is a rare breed, and unlike any place else in the world, we, th we looked at other cities. Um, and we believe that there are two categories that make sense, a limousine executive sedan category and a taxi cab category, um, a premium service and an on-demand type of service. So we define, for the most part, limousine executive sedan service as being determined when the trip is booked um, with the poten potentially in your definitions, you could put minimum fares, waiting time, and prearrangement as a requirement. For on-demand taxi service, um, we define taxi cab as accepting fares by street hail and or prearrangement, um, which is the norm throughout the country. Um, and it calculates fares through approved taxi meters or local regulatory requirements. Um, on the e-hail issue, we felt that an e-hail should be defined as prearrangement. Uh, the use of a smartphone is an electronic hail if the request for transportation is intended for immediate or on-demand transportation or prearranged if the request for transportation service is requested 30 minutes or prior uh, to the pickup of the pass passenger. Um, I don't know where that or came from. 30 minutes prior to the pickup of the passenger. All right, so look, 30 minutes was a time frame that we selected. You know, various jurisdictions may have other time frames. But there needs to be a distinction drawn because regulators need to know what they're dealing with. In fact, not all regulators have control over every, every, every and all of the above. Some have just control over taxis, and then there's another entity that controls limousines. This is the essence of the licensing uh, component of what we're doing. At the end of the day, every jurisdiction is a little bit different. Some have dispatch licenses. Some have certificates of public convenience and necessity for taxi cabs. Some have medallions. Some have base licenses, business licenses. Every city's a little bit different, okay? But the essence of what the committee and the model regs try to endeavor to, to accomplish is that someone needs to be held accountable. There are two ways you can skin the cat. Number one, you can just license, uh, create a new license or, as we're suggesting, a dispatch license because these apps are transportation companies. At the end of the day, um, they're marking themselves as transportation companies, not technology or dispatch companies that, you know, in the black car industry, for instance, in New York, for years, there's DDS and um, Aleph and all these other companies that were just providing uh, dispatch services to the industry. This is different. There's people handing out ice cream, f uh, free phones, this, all, this, that, and the other thing, and talking about how wonderful uh, they're going to be uh, to deal directly with passengers and, and, and basically bring them into the fold into the next century um, and in all the tech blogs how we're going to make transportation more efficient. It's, it, it's, these, these are transportation companies in disguise operating on your smartphone. They're dispatch companies. If, if, um, so depending on the jurisdiction, all the evils that I talked about, all, the surge pricing, the safety issues, all the accountability, 
you know, it needs to be a condition of licensure, either for a dispatch license or if you do business with the third party app, okay? The, another approach that regulators could take is to basically say, hey, I don't need a separate class of license, but um, if you are a medallion owner and you decide to enter into a contract with a third party app, if they do X, Y, and Z, if they surge pricing and overcharge, you're going to lose your medallion. That's the key. There needs to be somebody to be accountable. People can't just be loosely hanging out on the fringes. Um, the committee felt that um, you know, the, the word cab, taxi, or, or taxi cab could be permitted if the app is licensed as a dispatch business and again affiliated with and dispatch, dispatches only with taxi cabs. That loophole needs to be closed. Um, if the jurisdiction requires wheelchair accessible transportation, there has to be compulsory affiliation with a sufficient number of cabs. Uh, that are accessible and liability for service denials and are, dis and are discrimination. Um, a lot of cities now are, are approaching accessibility as a major issue. It's, it it's just a matter of time before the advocates start suing app companies uh, because when they use a certain app, there's no wheelchair accessible ca cab that shows up. Why should they be excluded from the transportation process? Um, that needs to be dealt with and right now it's not being dealt with. Um, Fares, uh, I th it's, it's not just the, the app operating as a meter, it's also the issue of disclosure of fares. Not finding out after you're out of the car already, you know, what, what the charge is, that you have some type of notice ahead of time. So smartphone apps and their affiliated drivers may not charge any fees, costs, or expenses to the passenger in excess of the fare displayed on the meter, the prearranged flat fare, or the hourly rate for the service provided. And I think we covered the issue uh, these model regs, if adopted by regulators, will have a provision that basically say, if there's no clarity on it now, this is a taxi meter, and until NIST and weights and measures and, and regulators approve it, it is banned. So these model regs, if, if um, basically put into place, will immediately ban apps that do time and distance until they're reviewed by the proper professionals and the software engineers who will determine whether your software is safe, accurate, and it works well, and it's not ripping people off. That's the, probably the single most important of all the various things that we talked about. There's also something, there are things that lawyers call adhesion contracts, and you know, you know, it's, it's wonderful when you'd buy a product and they say, we're not responsible for anything, right? You know, <laughs> anything happens, you know, it's not my problem. Um, no responsibility as a business owner. Well, you know, lawyers are there, um, you know, to try to make sure that that if there's an unfair contract that it's, it's basically um, it, it's reviewed in court. And courts do throw out contracts that are unfair, one-sided, um, on, the, on the basic principles of contract law. Uh, some of these rogue apps basically say, oh yeah, you know, we're, we're, we're the thing in the future. We're going to be providing the greatest transportation. We're handing out uh, all these freebies and we're marketing, social media, all this other stuff. But, oh, we have nothing to do with anything if it goes wrong. If someone gets killed or someone gets hurt, oh, we have nothing to do with it. Okay, so we just, you just sign your rights away as a taxi company, as a driver, or as a passenger. Okay, That's, that doesn't happen in America or in any civilized country like our members, and it shouldn't happen. So on the indemnification issue, um, we put a provision in the rules that says no entity or dispatch business may require passengers to indemnify or waive their rights to proceed against such dispatch business or any dispatch business relating to the provision of the transportation and or dispatch services. Okay, you should have the right to hold them accountable either under the regulatory structure or in a court of law. You can't escape the rule of law by, by, by having these, these, um, uh, these like 10 page agreements that pop up on your screen and it says to proceed, click I agree. Okay, so what is our agenda for today? Am I still on time here? Wow, impressing myself. <laughs> Karen's gonna be very happy with me. 9.30 to 10.45, session 2A. Like I said, each one of these technology stakeholders and our sponsors, thank you by the way. Um, I hope I didn't offend anybody. Um, <laughs> we're, gonna, we're gonna ask each of you to spend five minutes um, just talking about your app, your business, and to address some of the model regs. And we also have Bill from the TLPA who's gonna talk about the work of the app committee. Um, so from 11 to 12, we're going to we're going to take a, a break after session 2A. Then 11 to 12, we have Mr. Mason. Welcome back, by the way. London is back in the ITR. Let's give him a round of applause. 
Um, yeah, it's all, it was a, it, it was the Olympics, it was the budget, but we're happy to have you back, my friend. And we're looking forward to hearing what's been going on in London the last couple of years. Uh, and, and then also, uh, if, after John speaks, we're gonna have uh, John and Don from Weights and Measures talk about uh, how they approve meters, why it's important with respect to smartphone technology. And I also wanna thank, he couldn't make it here today, but really Craig Lacey from Seattle, who also is one of the few regulators that that actually has the responsibility for weights and measures as well, as, as, as well as licensing. Um, he really started the ball rolling with this. He was the first person to really start interacting with weights and measures, who he's got a great relationship with, to say, this is a problem. Let's deal with this. So he deserves a lot of credit. He was supposed to be here and speak. He had uh, commitments that he couldn't be here, but we're hoping to have him at our next conference. So I want to thank Craig for all his hard work. Um, and then, then we're going. So we're going to have um, you know some of the regulator perspectives from um, on, on the issue. Then uh, after lunch, we're going to have our first ever international public forum or hearing. Now we've never done this before. Um, neither have we held a November conference. <laughs> neither have we uh, done a cigar event uh, or a golf. Out. I mean, we're doing some new things at ITR. But we're going to have. Um, we'll set the ground rules at the time at the time of uh, the public hearing this afternoon. People are going to have to sign up and speak. Um, it can only be one person per entity. You'll get three minutes to talk about the model regs. And um, you could also, after that point in time, comment in writing. Um, our goal is to basically move forward and to try to make these regs law. They're not just going to, I can promise you, and I think you know I'm true to my word, these are going to become law. And you'll hear that from the regulators when they come up on the panel, OK? In one shape or form, this is going to happen. And we're going to make sure it happens. And the app committee, uh, we're going to, you know, to bring just like old days, uh, we're going to have like a commission meeting. We're going to have the, uh, the various regulators on the app committee join us. And we're going to uh, take testimony from this podium from all of you. We're going to record it. We're going to take minutes. And we're going to analyze it and really have an open mind and take into uh, serious uh, uh, consideration all of your comments. Then from 2.30 to 4, um, we're going to talk about all the integration between these various things. Um, payment processing, which kind of started all the tech movement uh, in New York City and beyond, is now uh, in, in the next generation, 3.0. So um, my former chief of staff, Ira, now the head of the Black Car Fund, who was the project manager for that whole innovative movement, is going to uh, chair a session with some tech providers um, that is going to talk about the payment processing issues of now and what payment processing is going to look like in the coming years. And it all ties in, because now worlds are colliding. Apps are colliding with payment processing. Um, it's all becoming one, uh, one mush. I had one more slide. That's the only other thing I wanted to say. This is serious, OK? It's not a joke. We are going to pass these regs. The ITR, and I'll talk about that in my speech this afternoon, is going to spend all of 2013, after we publish the final report, going to each and every jurisdiction that requests our help if we have to testify, we're going to testify, okay? If we have to get Barry and start lobbying Barry, we're going to lobby, okay? If we have to, you know, be t subpoenaed to testify in lawsuits, we'll show up. We'll get paid our per diem, whatever it is. Uh, we need to change the law. I mean, I think it's great that the industry is, is fighting back and doing all these things, but, you know, you know, even as a lawyer, lawsuits are probably, at the end of the day, a waste of time. Let's just change the regs and make it so that technology can survive, that it can thrive, and people can have a fair level playing field, and that they're, and, and everybody, let's tone the rhetoric down. Okay, we're all grown-ups here, okay? We're professionals. This is a serious issue. This is gonna be the future. Smartphone apps are the future of technology in transportation, and in, in general. I mean, I was lost last night. I, you know, people told me I handled it well. I, my world was, <laughs> My world is falling apart because I lost this thing. You know, it's, everything's going to be on, on these devices before you know it. So let's, let's, have a, let's not have name calling today, please. OK, let's all be cordial and nice. Let's, let's turn over a new leaf. This is a new day. Let's put the rhetoric behind us, OK? Um, I think we have like 50 reps from Uber here. Travis, thanks for coming. We, we're, we're happy you're here. We want to hear what you have to say, OK? I want to hear what all these folks have to say, too. Um, the regulators have an open mind, and they're going to tell you exactly how they feel when they're on the panel. We want to do the right thing by everybody, 
but you need to understand we're not cronies, okay? We're, we're not in anybody's pocket. Believe me, they're not in anybody's pocket. They won't even take a cup of coffee from you if, if you wanted to. They're just doing their jobs. The weights and measures people are doing their jobs. You know, very people, especially in the industry sometimes, are very quick to point out how, well, you're not doing anything. Well, you know what, we're doing something today, okay? So you can either get on the bus or you can chase after it. Thank you. Um, okay, you know who's going.